Homer's Iliad, Book 24. The funeral games were over. The troops dispersed and went to their ships, where they turned their attention to supper and a good night's sleep. But sleep, that masters all, had no hold on Achilles. Tears wet his face as he remembered his friend. He tossed and turned, yearning for Patroclus, for his manhood and his noble heart, and all they had done together, the shared pain, the battles fought, the hard times at sea. Thinking on all this, he would weep softly, lying now on his side, now on his back, and now face down. Then he would rise to his feet and wander in a daze along the shore. Dawn never escaped him. As soon as she appeared over the sea and the dunes, he would hitch horses to his chariot and drag Hector behind. When he had hauled him three times around Patroclus' tomb, he would rest again in his hut, leaving Hector stretched face down in the dust. But Apollo kept Hector's flesh undefiled, pitying the man even in death. He kept him wrapped in his golden ages, so that Achilles would not scour the skin as he dragged him. So Achilles defiled Hector in his rage. The gods, looking on, pitied Hector and urged Hermes to steal the body, a plan that pleased all but Hera, Poseidon, and the gray-eyed one, who were steady in their hatred for sacred Ilion and Priam's people ever since Paris, in his blindness, offended these two goddesses and honored the one who fed his fatal lust. Twelve days went by. Dawn. Phoebus Apollo addressed the immortals. How callous can you get? Has Hector never burned for you thighs of bulls and goats? Of course he has! But now you cannot bring yourselves to save even his bare corpse for his wife to look upon, and his mother, and child, and Priam and his people who would burn him in fire and perform his funeral rites. No, it's the dread Achilles that you prefer. His twisted mind is set on what he wants, as savage as a lion bristling with pride, attacking men's flocks to make himself a feast. Achilles has lost all pity and has no shame left. Shame sometimes hurts men, but it helps them too. A man may lose someone dearer than Achilles has, a brother from the same womb, or a son. But when he has wept and mourned, he lets go. The fates have given men an enduring heart, but this man... After he kills Hector, he ties him behind his chariot and drags him around his dear friend's tomb? Does this make him a better or nobler man? He should fear our wrath, good as he may be, for he defiles the dumb earth in his rage. This provoked an angry response from Hera. What you say might be true, Silverbow, if we valued Achilles and a Hector equally. But Hector is mortal and suckled at a woman's breast, while Achilles is born of a goddess whom I nourished and reared myself and gave to a man, Peleus, beloved of the gods, to be his wife. All of you gods came to her wedding, 
and you too were at the feast, liar in hand, our forever faithless and fair-weather friend. And Zeus, who masses the thunderheads, calm down, Hera, and don't be so indignant. Their honor will not be the same. But Hector was dearest to the gods of all in Ilion, at least to me. He never failed to offer a pleasing sacrifice. My altar never lacked libation or burnt savor, our worship due. But we will not allow his body to be stolen. Achilles would notice in any case his mother visits him continually night and day, but I would have one of you summon Thetis so that I might have a word with her. Achilles must agree to let Priam ransom Hector. Thus spoke Zeus, and Iris stormed down to deliver his message. Midway between Samos and rocky Imbros, she dove into the dark sea. The water moaned as it closed above her, and she sank into the deep like a lead sinker on a line that takes a hook of sharpened horn down to deal death to nibbling fish. She found Thetis in a cave's hollow, surrounded by her saltwater women and wailing the fate of her faultless son, who would die on Trojan soil far from his homeland. Iris, whose feet are like wind, stood near her. Rise, Thetis, Zeus in his wisdom commands you. And the silver-footed goddess answered her, why would the great god want me? I am ashamed to mingle with the immortals, distraught as I am, but I will go, and he will not speak in vain. And she veiled her brightness in a shawl of midnight blue and set out with Iris before her. The sea parted around them in waves. They stepped forth on the beach and sped up the sky and found themselves before the face of Zeus. Around him were seated all the gods, blessed, eternal. Thetis sat next to him, and Athena gave place. Hera put her hand, a fine golden cup, and said some comforting words. Thetis drank and handed the cup back. Then Zeus, the father of gods and men, began to speak. You have come to Olympus, Thetis, for all your incurable sorrow. I know. Even so, I will tell you why I have called you. For nine days the gods have argued about Hector's corpse and about Achilles. Some want Hermes to steal the body away, but I accord Achilles the honor in this, hoping to retain your friendship along with your respect. Go quickly now and tell your son our will. The gods are indignant, and I, above all, am angry that in his heart's fury he holds Hector by the beaked ships and will not give him up. He may, perhaps, fear me, and so release the body. Meanwhile, I will send Iris to great-souled Priam to have him ransom his son, going to the ships with gifts that will warm Achilles' heart. Zeus had spoken, and the silver-footed goddess streaked down from the peaks of Olympus and came to her son's hut, she found him there, lost in grief. His friends were all around, busily preparing their morning meal, for which a great shaggy ram had been slaughtered. Settling herself beside her weeping child, she stroked him with her hand and talked to him. My son, 
How long will you let this grief eat at your heart, mindless of food and rest? It would be good to make love to a woman. It hurts me to say it. But you will not live much longer. Death and doom are beside you. Listen now, I have a message from Zeus. The gods are indignant, and he, above all, is angry that in your heart's fury you hold Hector by these beaked ships and will not give him up. Come now, release the body, and take ransom for the dead. And Achilles, swift of foot, answered her. So be it. Let them ransom the dead, if the god on Olympus wills it so. So mother and son spoke many words to each other with the Greek ships all around. Meanwhile, Zeus dispatched Iris to Troy. Up now, swift Iris, leave Olympus for sacred Ilion and tell Priam he must go to the Greek ships to ransom his son with gifts that will soften Achilles' heart. Alone he must go with only one attendant, an elder, to drive the mule cart and bear the man slain by Achilles back to the city. He need have no fear. He, We will send as his guide and escort Hermes himself, who will lead him all the way to Achilles, and when he is inside Achilles' hut, Achilles will not kill him, but will protect him from all the rest, for he is not a fool, nor hardened, nor passed off of the gods. He will in kindness spare a suppliant. Iris stormed down to deliver this message. She came to the house of Priam and found their mourning and lamentation. Priam's sons sat in the courtyard around their father, fouling their clothes with tears. The old man, wrapped in his mantle, sat like graven stone. His head and neck were covered with dung he had rolled in and scraped up with his hands. His daughters and sons' wives were wailing throughout the house, remembering their men, so many and fine, dead by Greek hands. Zeus's messenger stood near Priam, who trembled all over, as she whispered, Courage, Priam, son of Dardanus, and have no fear. I have come to you not to announce evil, but good. I am a messenger from Zeus, who cares for you greatly and pities you. You must go to the Greek ships to ransom Hector with gifts that will soften Achilles' heart. You must go alone with only one attendant, an elder, to drive the mule cart and bear the man slain by Achilles back to the city. You need have no fear. We will send as your guide and escort Hermes himself, who will lead you all the way to Achilles. And when you are inside Achilles' hut, Achilles will not kill you, but will protect you from all the rest, for he is not a fool, nor hardened, nor passed off, or the gods... He will, in kindness, spare a suppliant. Iris spoke and was gone, a blur in the air. Priam ordered his sons to ready the mule cart and fasten onto it the wicker trunk. He himself went down to a high vaulted chamber, fragrant with cedar that glittered with jewels. And he called to Hecuba, his wife, and said, a messenger has come from Olympian Zeus. I am to go to the ships to ransom our son and bring gifts that will soften Achilles' heart. What do you make of this, lady? For myself, I have a strange compulsion to go over there into the wide camp of the Achaean ships. Her first response was a shrill cry, and then... This is madness. 
Where is the wisdom you were once respected for at home and abroad? How can you want to go to the Greek ships alone and look into the eyes of the man who has killed so many of your fine sons? Your heart is iron. If he catches you or even sees you, he will not pity you or respect you, savage and faithless as he is. No, we must mourn from afar, sitting in our hall. This is how fate spun her stern thread for him in my womb, that he would glut lean hounds far from his parents with that violent man close by. I could rip his liver bleeding from his guts and eat it whole. That would be at least some vengeance for my son. He was no coward, but died protecting the men and women of Troy without a thought of shelter or flight. And the old man, godlike Priam, don't hold me back when I want to go, and don't be a bird of ill omen in my halls. You will not persuade me. If anyone else on earth told me to do this, a seer, a diviner, or priest, we would set it aside and count it false. But I heard the goddess myself and saw her face. I will go, and her word will not be in vain. If I am fated to die by the Achaean ships, it must be so. Let Achilles cut me down as soon as I have taken my son in my arms and have satisfied my desire for grief. He began to lift up the lids of chests and took out a dozen beautiful robes, a dozen single-fold cloaks, as many rugs, and added as many white mantles and tunics. He weighed and brought out ten talents of gold, two glowing tripods and four cauldrons with them, an exquisite cup, a state gift from the Thracians, and a great treasure. The old man spared nothing in his house, not even this, in his passion to ransom his son. Once out in the portico, he drove off the men there with bitter words. Get out, you sorry excuses for Trojans! Don't you have enough grief at home that you have to come here and plague me? Isn't it enough that Zeus has given me the pain and sorrow of losing my finest son? You'll feel it yourselves soon enough. With him dead, you'll be much easier for the Greeks to pick off. But may I be dead and gone before I see my city plundered and destroyed. And he waded through them, scattering them with his staff. Then he called to his sons in a harsh voice, Helenus and Paris, Agathon, Pamon, Antiphonus, Pelides, Diaphobus, Hippothus, and noble Dias, these nine, and shouted at them, Come here, you miserable brats! I wish all of you had been killed by the ships instead of Hector. I have no luck at all. I have fathered the best sons in all wide Troy, and not one, not one, I say, is left. Not Mestor, godlike Mestor. Not Troilus, the charioteer. Not Hector, who was like a god among men, like the son of a god, not of a mortal. Ares killed them, and now all I have left are these petty delinquents, pretty boys, and cheats. These... Dancers, toe-tapping champions, renowned throughout the neighborhood for filching goats. Now, will you please get the wagon ready and load all this on so I can leave? They cringed under their father's rebuke and brought out the smooth rolling wagon, a beauty, just joineered and clamped on the wicker trunk. They took the mule yoke down from its peg, a knobbed boxwood yoke fitted with guide rings and the yoke band with it, a rope fifteen feet long. They set the yoke with care upon the upturned end of the polished pole, placing the ring on the thole pin and lashed it tight 
to the knob with three turns each way, then tied the ends to the hitch under the hook. This done, they brought from the treasure chamber the lavish ransom for Hector's head, and heaped it on the hand-rubbed wagon. Then they yoked the mules, strong-hooved animals that pull in harness, splendid gifts from the Mysians to Priam. And for Priam they yoked to a chariot horses reared by the king's hand at their polished stall. So Priam and his herald, their minds racing, were having their rigs yoked in the high palace when Hecuba approached them sorrowfully. She held in her right hand a golden cup of honeyed wine for them to pour libation before they went. Standing by the horses, she said, Here, pour libation to Father Zeus and pray for your safe return for the, from the enemy camp, since you are set on going there against my will. Pray to Cronion, the dark cloud of Ida, who watches over the whole land of Troy, and ask for an omen, that swiftest of birds that is his messenger, the king of birds, to appear on the right before your own eyes, something to trust in as you go to the ships. But if Zeus will not grant his own messenger, I would not advise or encourage you to go to the ships, however eager you are. And Priam, with grave dignity, I will not disregard your advice, my wife. It is not good, it is good to lift hands to Zeus for mercy. And he nodded to the handmaid to pour pure water over their hands, and she came up with basin and pitcher. Hands washed, he took the cup from his wife and prayed, standing in the middle of the courtyard and pouring out wine as he looked up to heaven. Father Zeus, who rules from Ida, most glorious, most great, send me to Achilles, welcome and pitied, and send me an omen, that swiftest of birds that is your messenger, the king of birds to appear on the right before my own eyes, that I may trust it as I go to the ships. Zeus heard his prayer and sent an eagle, the surest omen in the sky, a dusky hunter men call the dark eagle, a bird as large as a doorway, with a wingspan as wide as the folding doors to a vaulted chamber in a rich man's house. It flashed on the right as it soared through the city, and when they saw it, their mood brightened. Hurrying now, the old man stepped into his chariot and drove off from the gateway and echoing portico. In front of him, the mules pulled the wagon with Idaeus at the reins. Priam kept urging his horses with the lash as they drove quickly through the city. His kinsmen trailed behind, all of them wailing as if he were going to his death. When they had gone down from the city and onto the plain, his sons and sons-in-law turned back to Troy. But Zeus saw them as they entered the plain, and he pitied the old man, and said to his son Hermes, Hermes, there's nothing you like more than being a companion to men, and you do obey when you have a mind to. So go now and lead Priam to the Achaean ships, unseen and unnoticed, until he comes to Achilles. Thus Zeus and the quicksilver courier complied, lacing on his feet the beautiful sandals, immortal and golden, that carry him over landscape and seascape in a rush of wind. And he took the wand he uses to charm mortal eyes asleep and make sleepers awake. Holding this wand, the tough quicksilver god flew down to Troy on the Hellspont and walked off as a young prince whose beard was just darkening, youth at its loveliest. Priam and Idaeus had just driven past the barrow of Ilus and had halted the mules and horses in the river to drink, by now it was dusk. Idaeus looked up and was aware of Hermes close by. 
He turned to Priam and said, Beware, son of Dardanus, there's someone here, and if we're not careful we'll be cut to bits. Should we escape in the chariot or clasp his knees and see if he will pity us? But the old man's mind had melted with fear. The hair bristled on his gnarled limbs, and he stood frozen with fear. But the helper came up and took the old man's hand and said to him, Sir, where are you driving your horses and mules at this hour of the night when all else is asleep? Don't you fear the fury of the Achaeans, your ruthless enemies who are close at hand? If one of them should see you bearing such treasure through the black night, what would you do? You are not young, sir, and your companion is old, unable to defend you if someone starts a fight. But I will do you no harm, and will protect you from others. You remind me of my own dear father. And the old man, godlike Priam, answered, Yes, dear son, it is just as you say, but some god has stretched out his hand and sent an auspicious wayfarer to meet me. You have an impressive build, good looks, and intelligence. Blessed are your parents. And the guide, limed in silver light, a very good way to put it, old sir, but tell me this now and tell me the truth. Are you taking all this valuable treasure for safekeeping abroad, or are you all for sacred, sacred Ilion in fear? You have lost such a great warrior, the noblest, your son. He never let up against the Achaeans. And the old man, godlike Priam, answered, Who are you? I'm from what parents born, that you speak so well about my ill-fated son? And Hermes, limed in silver, answered, Ah, a test, <laughs> and a question about Hector. I have often seen him win glory in battle. He would drive the Argives back to their ships and carve them to pieces with his bronze blade. And we stood there and marveled, for Achilles, angry with Agamemnon, would not let us fight. I am his comrade in arms from the same ship, a Myrmidon. My father is Polyector, a wealthy man, and about as old as you. He had six other sons, seven counting me. We cast lots, and I was chosen to come here. Now I have come out to the plain from the ships, because at dawn the Achaeans will lay siege to the city. They are restless, and their lords cannot restrain them from battle. And the old man, godlike Priam, answered him, if you really are one of Achilles' men, tell me this, and I want the whole truth. Is my son still by the ships, or has Achilles cut him up by now and thrown him to the dogs? And Hermes limed in silver light. Not yet, old sir. The dogs and birds have not devoured him. He lies beside Achilles' ship, amid the huts, just as he was at first. This is now the twelfth day he has been lying there, but his flesh has not decayed at all, nor is it consumed by worms that eat the battle slain. Achilles does drag him around his dear friend's tomb, and ruthlessly every morning at dawn, but he stays unmarred. You would marvel if you came to see him lie as fresh as dew, washed clean of blood, and uncorrupted, all the wounds he had are closed. There were many who drove their bronze in him. This is how the blessed gods care for your son, corpse though he be, for he was dear to their hearts. And the old man was glad and answered, Yes, my boy, it is good to offer the immortals their due. If ever there was anyone in my house who never forgot the Olympian gods, it was my son. And so now they have remembered him, even in death. But come, accept from me this fine cup, and give me safe escort with the gods until I come to the hut of Peleus' son. And Hermes glittering in the dark, ah, an old man testing a young one, but you will not get me to take gifts from you without Achilles' knowledge. 
I respect him and fear him too much to defraud him. I shudder to think of the consequences, but I would escort you all the way to Argos with attentive care by ship or on foot, and no one would fight you for scorn of your escort. And he leapt into the chariot, took the reins and whip, and breathed great power into the horses and mules when they came to the palisade and trench surrounding the ships. The guards were at supper. Hermes sprinkled them with drowsiness, then opened the gates, pushed back the bars, and led in Priam and the cart piled with ransom. They came to the hut of the son of Peleus that the Myrmidons had built for their lord. They built it high out of hewn fir beams and roofed it with thatch reaped from the meadows. Around it they made him a great courtyard with thick set staves. A single bar of fir held the gate shut. It took three men to drive this bar home and three to pull it back, but Achilles could work it easily alone. Hermes opened the gate for Priam and brought in the gifts for Peleus' swift son. As he stepped to the ground, he said, I am one of the immortals, old sir, the god Hermes. My father sent me to escort you here. I will go back now and not come before Achilles' eyes. It would be offensive for a god to greet a mortal face to face. You go in, though and clasp the knees of the son of Peleus, and entreat him by his father and rich-haired mother, and by his son, so you will stir his soul. And with that, Hermes left and returned to high Olympus. Priam jumped down and left Idaeus to hold the horses and mules. The old man went straight to the house, where Achilles, dear to Zeus, sat and waited. He found him inside. His companions sat apart from him, and a solitary pair, Automedon and Alchemus, warriors both, were busy at his side. He had just finished his evening meal. The table was still set up. Great Priam entered unnoticed. He stood close to Achilles, and touching his knees, he kissed the dread and murderous hands that had killed so many of his sons. Passion sometimes blinds a man so completely that he kills one of his own countrymen. In exile, he comes into a wealthy house and everyone stares at him with wonder. So Achilles stared in wonder at Priam. Was he a god? And the others there stared and wondered and looked at each other. But Priam spoke a prayer of entreaty. Remember your father, godlike Achilles. He and I both are on the doorstep of old age. He may well be now surrounded by enemies, wearing him down, and have no one to protect him from harm. But then he hears that you are still alive, and his heart rejoices, and he hopes all his days to see his dear son come back from Troy. But what is left for me? I had the finest sons in all wide Troy, and not one of them is left. Fifty I had when the Greeks came over, nineteen out of one belly, and the rest the women in my house bore to me. 
It doesn't matter how many they were. The god of war has cut them down at the knees. And the only one who could save the city, you've just now killed as he fought for his country. My Hector. It is for him I have come to the Greek ships to get him back from you. I've brought a fortune in ransom. Respect the gods, Achilles. Think of your own father and pity me. I am more pitiable. I have borne what no man who has walked this earth has ever yet borne. I have kissed the hand of the man who killed my son. He spoke, and sorrow for his own father welled up in Achilles. He took Priam's hand and gently pushed the old man away. The two of them remembered. Priam huddled in grief at Achilles' feet, cried and moaned softly for his man-slaying Hector. And Achilles cried for his father and for Patroclus. The sound filled the room. When Achilles had his fill of grief and the aching sorrow left his heart, he rose from his chair and lifted the old man by his hand pitying his white hair and beard, and his words enfolded him like wings. Ah, the suffering you've had, and the courage to come here alone to the Greek ships and meet my eye, the man who slaughtered your many Fine sons, you have a heart of iron. But come, sit on this chair. Let our pain lie at rest a while. No matter how much we hurt, there's nothing to be gained from cold grief. Yes, the gods have woven pain into mortal lives while they are free from care. Two jars sit at the doorstep of Zeus, filled with gifts that he gives, one full of good things, the other of evil. If Zeus gives a man a mixture from both jars, sometimes life is good for him, sometimes not. But if all he gives you is from the jar of woe, you become a pariah, and hunger drives you over the bright earth dishonored by gods and men. Now take Peleus. The gods gave him splendid gifts from the day he was born. He was the happiest and richest man on earth, king of the Myrmidons. And although he was a mortal, the gods gave him an immortal goddess to be his wife. But even to Peleus, the god gave some evil. He would not leave offspring to succeed him in power, just one child all out of season. I can't be with him to take care of him now that he's old since I'm far from my fatherland, squatting here in Troy, tormenting you and your children. And you, old sir, we hear that you were prosperous once from Lesbos down south clear over to Phrygia and up to the Hellspont's boundary. No one could match you in wealth or in sons, but then the gods have brought you trouble, this constant fighting and killing around your town. You must endure this grief 
and not constantly grieve. You will not gain anything by torturing yourself over the good son you lost, not bring him back. Sooner you will suffer some other sorrow. And Priam, old and godlike, answered him, Don't sit me in a chair, prince, while Hector lies uncared for in your hut. Deliver him now, so I can see him with my own eyes. And you, take all this ransom we bring. Take pleasure in it, and go back home to your own fatherland, since you've taken this first step and allowed me to live and see the light of day. Achilles glowered at him and said, Don't provoke me, old man. It's my own decision to release Hector to you. A messenger came to me from Zeus, my own natural mother, daughter of the old sea god, and I know you, Priam, inside and out. You don't fool me one bit. Some god escorted you to the Greek ships. No mortal would have dared to come into our camp, not even your best young hero. He couldn't have gotten past the guards or muscled open the gate. So just stop stirring up grief in my heart, or I might not let you out of here alive, old man, suppliant though you are, and sin against Zeus. The old man was afraid and did as he was told. The son of Peleus leapt out the door like a lion, followed by Altomedon and Alchemus, whom Achilles honored most now that Patroclus was dead. They unyoked the horses and mules and led the old man's herald inside and seated him on a chair. Then they unloaded from the strong-wheeled cart the endless ransom that was Hector's blood price, leaving behind two robes and a fine-spun tunic for the body to be wrapped in and brought inside. Achilles called the women and ordered them to wash the body well and anoint it with oil removing it first for fear that Priam might see his son and in his grief be unable to control his anger at the sight of his child, and that this would arouse Achilles' passion and he would kill the old man and so sin against the commandments of Zeus. After the female slaves had bathed Hector's body and anointed it with olive, they wrapped it round with a beautiful robe and tunic, and Achilles himself lifted him up and placed him on a pallet, and with his friends raised it onto the polished cart. Then he groaned and called out to Patroclus, Don't be angry with me, dear friend, if somehow you find out, even in Hades, that I have released Hector to his father. He paid a handsome price, and I will share it with you as much as is right. Achilles re-entered his hut and sat down again in his ornately decorated chair across the room from Priam and said to him your son is released sir as you ordered he is lying on a pallet at dawn's first light you will go see him yourself now let's think about supper even Niobe remembered to eat although her twelve children were dead in her house six daughters and six sturdy sons Apollo killed them with his silver bow, and Artemis, showering arrows, angry with Niobe because she compared herself to beautiful Leto. Leto, she said, had borne only two, while she had borne many. Well, these two killed them all. Nine days they lay in their gore, with no one to bury them, because Zeus had turned the people to stone. On the tenth day, the gods buried them, but Niobe remembered she had to eat, exhausted from weeping. Now she is one of the rocks in the lonely hills somewhere in Sipilos, a place they say is haunted by nymphs who dance on the Achelos banks, and although she is stone, she broods on the sorrows the gods gave her. Well, so should we, old sir. Remember to eat. You can mourn your son later when you bring him to Troy. You owe him many tears. 
A moment later, Achilles was up and had slain a silvery sheep. His companions flayed it and prepared it for a meal, sliced it, spitted it, roasted the morsels, and drew them off the spits. Automedon set out bread in exquisite baskets while Achilles served the meat. They helped themselves and satisfied their desire for food and drink. Then Priam, son of Dardanus, gazed for a while at Achilles. So big, so much like one of the gods. And Achilles returned his gaze, admiring Priam's face, his words echoing in his mind. When they had their fill of gazing at each other, Priam, old and godlike, broke the silence. Show me to my bed now prince and quickly so that at long last I can have the pleasure of sleep my eyes have not closed since my son lost his life under your hands I have done nothing but groan and brood over my countless sorrows rolling in the dung of my courtyard stables finally I have tasted food and let flaming wine pass down my throat. I had eaten nothing till now. Achilles ordered his companions and women to set bedsteads on the porch and pad them with fine dyed rugs, spread blankets on top and cover them over with fleecy cloaks. The women went out with torches in their hands and quickly made up two beds, and Achilles, the great sprinter, said in a bitter tone, You will have to sleep outside, dear Priam. One of the Achaean counselors may come in, as they always do, to sit and talk with me, as well they should. If one of them saw you here in the dead of night, he would tell Agamemnon that would delay releasing the body. But tell me this as precisely as you can. How many days do you need for the funeral? I will wait that long and hold back the army. And the old man, godlike Priam, answered, If you really want me to bury my Hector, then you could do this for me, Achilles. You know how we are penned in the city, far from any timber, and the Trojans are afraid. We would mourn him for nine days in our halls, and bury him on the tenth, and feast the people. On the eleventh we would heap a burrow over him, and on the twelfth day fight, if fight we must. And Achilles, strong, swift, and godlike, you have your armistice. And he clasped the old man's wrist, so he would not be afraid. And so they slept, Priam and his herald in the covered courtyard, each with a wealth of thoughts in his breast. But Achilles slept inside his well-built hut, and by his side lay lovely Briseis. Gods and heroes slept the night through, wrapped in soft slumber, only Hermes lay awake in the dark, pondering how to spirit King Priam away from the ships and elude the strong watchmen at the camp's gates. He hovered above Priam's head and spoke. Well, old man, you seem to think it's safe to sleep on and on in the enemy camp since Achilles spared you. Think what it cost you to ransom your son. Your own life will cost three times that much to the sons you have left, if Agamemnon and the Greeks know you are here. Suddenly the old man was afraid. He woke up the herald. Hermes harnessed the horses and mules, drove them through the camp. No one noticed, and when they reached the ford of Xanthus, the beautiful swirling river that Zeus begot, Hermes left for the long peak of Olympus. Dawn spread her saffron light over earth, and they drove the horses into the city with great lamentation. The mules pulled 
the corpse. No one in Troy, man or woman, saw them before Cassandra, who stood like golden Aphrodite on Pergamum's height. Looking out, she saw her dear father standing in the chariot with the herald, and then she saw Hector lying on the stretcher in the mule cart, and her cry went out through all the city. Come look upon Hector, Trojan men and women, if ever you rejoiced when he came home alive from battle, a joy to the city and all its people. She spoke, and there was not a man or woman left in the city, for an unbearable sorrow had come upon them. They met Priam by the gates as he brought the body through, and in the front Hector's dear wife and queenly mother threw themselves on the rolling cart and pulled out their hair as they clasped his head amid the grieving crowd. They would have mourned Hector outside the gates all the long day until the sun went down had not the old man spoken from his chariot. Let the mules come through. Later you will have your fill of grieving after I have brought him home. He spoke, and the crowd made way for the cart, and they brought him home and laid him on a corded bed, and set around him singers to lead the dirge and chant the death song. They chanted the dirge, and the women with them, white-armed Andromache, led the lamentations as she cradled the head of her manslaying Hector. You have died, young husband, and left me a widow in the halls. Our son is still an infant, doomed when we bore him. I do not think he will ever reach manhood. No, this city will topple and fall first. You were its savior, and now you are lost. All the solemn wives and children you guarded will go off soon in the hollow ships, and I will go with them. And you, my son, you will either come with me and do menial labor for a cruel master, or some Greek will lead you by the hand and throw you from the tower. A hideous death, angry, because Hector killed his brother, or his father, or son. Many, many Greeks fell in battle under Hector's hands. Your father was never gentle in combat. And so all the townspeople mourn for him, and you have caused your parents unspeakable sorrow, Hector and left me endless pain. You did not stretch your hand out to me as you lay dying in bed, nor did you whisper a final word I could remember as I weep all the days and nights of my life. The women's moans washed over her lament, and from the sobbing came Hecuba's voice. Hector, my heart, dearest of all my children, the gods loved you when you were alive for me, and they have cared for you also in death. My other children, Achilles, sold as slaves when he captured them, shipped them overseas to Samos, Imbrios, and barren Lemnos. After he took your life with tapered bronze, he dragged you around Patroclus' tomb, his friend whom you killed, but still could not bring him back. And now you lie here for me as fresh as dew, although you have been slain like one whom Apollo has killed softly with his silver arrows. 
the third woman to lament was Helen. Oh, Hector, you were the dearest to me by far of all my husband's brothers. Yes, Paris is my husband, the godlike prince who led me to Troy. I should have died first. This is now the twentieth year since I went away and left my home, and I have never had an unkind word from you. If anyone in the house ever taunted me, any of my husband's brothers or sisters or his mother, my father-in-law was kind always, you would draw them aside and calm them with your gentle heart and gentle words. And so I weep for you and for myself, and my heart is heavy, because there is no one left in all wide Troy who will pity me or be my friend. Everyone shudders at me. And the people's moan came in over her voice. Then the old man Priam spoke to his people. Men of Troy, start bringing wood to the city and have no fear of an Argive ambush. When Achilles sent me from the black ships, he gave his word he would not trouble us until the twelfth day should dawn. He spoke, and they yoked the oxen and mules to wagons and gathered outside the city. For nine days they hauled in loads of timber. When the tenth dawn showed her mortal light, they brought out their brave Hector, and all in tears lifted the body high onto the bier and threw on the fire. Light blossomed like roses in the eastern sky. The people gathered around Hector's pyre, and when all of Troy was assembled there, they drowned the last flames with glinting wine. Hector's brothers and friends collected his white bones, their cheeks flowered with tears. They wrapped the bones in soft purple robes and placed them in a golden casket and laid it in the hollow of the grave and heaped above it a mantle of stones. They built the tomb quickly with lookouts posted all around in case the Greeks should attack early. When the tomb was built, they all returned to the city and assembled for a glorious feast in the house of Priam, Zeus's cherished king. That was the funeral of Hector, breaker of horses. And that is the end of Iliad. Forgiveness brings peace. Out of all the things Achilles did. Killing more Trojans, killing Hector, killing twelve boys, sacrificing hundreds of animals, burning his friend, having a funeral, and then each morning dragging the dead body of Hector around Patroclus' tomb. After all this, he still grieves. He still is lost in his grief. He is n still unable to find peace. And then when Priam comes to him for a ransom, just like how this story started, a father coming to ransom their child, Achilles 
honors that tradition. And the two of them, he, he could kill Priam there, end the whole war. But instead he takes his hand, and the two of them weep. And they're still enemies. Achilles even starts to threaten him. He's like, don't forget what's going on here, Priam. <laughs> I could still kill you. But enemies can still show respect. And forgiveness does not mean that nothing has happened. It is a way of facing what happened. And that, I believe, is why this book for so long was basically the most important book people had. This whole book, we've got all these tragedies, all these people dying, and from one person's side it's this glorious, wonderful thing, and from the other side we hear about their mom or sister or wife or their dad who's gonna be, whose life is ruined now forever. And then that finally reaches Hector. The theme punches back, sorry, reaches Achilles. The theme punches back to him, and he feels that pain for the first time in his life. And we see the reality of this glorious war, and or I should say the full picture, because I think the point of this book isn't to say that war can't be glorious necessarily, but that that's not all there is to it. And when you've killed the people who have wronged you, it's like what I said last time. The, when you burn a, when you make a fire, it feels good, but it keeps it, it makes you just want to burn more stuff. It doesn't satisfy you. And um, when they have this funeral, everyone is able to grieve properly you know the uh, wives mothers priam all of them it's like when we last left andromache she was basically angry at hector <laughs> almost like just the you know denial anger you know bargaining grief acceptance the stages of grief and um we see that here i think uh, in a weird way, Andromache comes to acceptance of what's going to happen. Now, some of you, now I could go on and on about forgiveness and respect, and I think people have gone on about that for thousands of years. And I really do think that the only way that you can stop like it, something like this is like, you know, after one one thing that I learned from my family when we won World War II is that um, you don't go and kill all the Nazis at all the Germans after that you there needs to be a forgiveness that happens so that the world can move on and um, my papa apparently lived next door to some German immigrants in Texas uh, and my father said that he never heard him say a single bad thing about them his whole life. Uh, and as it would have, hey look, America and Germany get on pretty well. Well, there wasn't that kind of thing that happened after World War One, and we kind of know how that story went. We kind of learned our lesson with World War I. Um, so now World War II, Japan, Germany, they're doing all right. And part of that is because of how the aftermath of the war was treated. Um, now, some of you may be, I'm, I'm going to move on a bit more with some more analysis, which is that this, uh, I'm sure many of you are wondering, where's the wooden horse? <laughs> uh, yeah, I wondered that the first time I read it too. In fact, the first time I read this, I didn't quite understand what the point of this was. The climax of this book isn't even the death of Hector. The climax of this book is obviously not the Trojan horse. It's not even in this. The climax of this book is when Priam goes to Achilles. 
and that is why Achilles is the main character. Hector is the hero. Achilles is not the hero, but he's the main character because he's the one who changes. We start the book with his rage, with his pride, and which eventually turns totally into selfishness, which then costs the Greeks and himself incalculable pain, which leads to the death of the most important person in his life. And he rages and rages. The first word of this story is menin, which means rage. Rage. And by the end of it, Achilles has found peace. I find that fascinating. So, all right, what happened after Iliad then? Because we're gonna, I'm gonna continue the story for you a little bit. What happened to all these people? Well, the war continued for a while, and Achilles, one day, was fighting outside the western gate, just like Hector said he would be, and Paris, that piss poor shot with a bow who crowed with joy when he got Diomedes in the foot or whatever shot at Achilles with a poison tipped arrow and Apollo fixed his shot and tilted the arrow so that it landed right in Achilles heel which you may remember was the only part of his body which was not exposed to the water of the river Styx when his mother Thetis dipped him into the river Styx in the underworld to make him impervious. So Achilles was killed by Paris and Apollo. But Odysseus and Ajax fought to save his body and armor. But when they did so, they argued over the armor. And the armor was taken to Mount Olympus by the gods. And they both argued with the gods as to which one of them should have this incredible armor that Hephaestus had made for them. And Odysseus, of course, as with any talking contest, won. In pain and loss of his dear friend's life, and perhaps by not having anything to remember him by, Ajax, Telamonian Ajax the Greater, went insane and tried to slaughter his fellow countrymen in a fit of rage and insanity, but then saw a herd of cattle that he thought were Greeks in his madness, and he slaughtered an entire herd of cattle, and then when he came around and realized everything that he had done, he was so afraid at the edge, he committed suicide. Eventually, the Greeks devised a plan, I believe it was Odysseus's idea, to end the war, which was to feign a retreat where they all left the camp in a rush, and in the camp there was a giant wooden horse, which was an offering to Poseidon, who created the first horse, and the Trojans saw this offering, and they brought it into the city, and they were happy because after so long, the war was finally over, and the horse was so big, they had to take the cross piece at the top of the gate off. They had to break the gate off so that the horse, which was too tall, could actually make it into the city. Perhaps symbolic of we don't even need to protect ourselves with these walls and this gate finally. But then, of course, that night, many Greek heroes including Diomedes, who had stowed away inside the Trojan horse, crept out, opened the gates, and the Greeks had not fully retreated. They had just gone in their boats and hid around a peninsula. Tricky Greeks. I think that's, uh, there's a saying, beware of Greeks bearing gifts, <laughs> and uh, because of this story. And so... Troy was sacked. Paris is shot, I think, actually, before Troy is, uh, before Troy is um, sacked. Paris is shot, and his ex-wife refuses to heal him. And then she, out of remorse, like, 
changes her mind and she goes to see him to heal him to reveal that he has died in her absence because she wouldn't heal him and it was too little too late and so she hung herself this isn't Helen this is Paris's ex-wife Priam during the sacking of Troy is killed on the altar of Zeus by Achilles son Nept uh, Neptolemus but he also kills Priam's uh, son Polites in front of him first Hecuba is taken as a slave but blinds Polymestor who killed her son she is turned into a dog and casts herself into the sea and dies Neptolemus uh, Achilles son who eventually joined the war of course takes Astyanax Hector's son from the arms of Andromache and throws him from the wall killing him he marries Andromache and then when Neptolemus dies Andromache marries one of Hector's brothers and then after that she lives with her youngest son and dies of old age she visited Hector's monument daily and was known for her faithfulness to her godlike husband Agamemnon returns home but is killed by his wife because of the murder and sacrifice of their daughter that he made at the outset of the war she kills him with a double-headed axe to the head which is the same way that Zeus that which is the same way that Athena was born when Zeus got a double-headed axe to the head is a, a ceremonial um, artifact and Athena leapt out but this time when Agamemnon's wife put an axe in his head no wisdom came out because if there had been any there it wouldn't have been buried in his forehead to begin with perhaps Diomedes returns home to find that his wife has been unfaithful because Aphrodite um, who never forgot the scratch on her hand that he gave her at the behest of Athena has basically bewitched his wife and then his right to the throne is challenged and he flees for his life eventually he he um, is the founder of a city which Romans live in but there are two other characters that I think you might want to know about one of them is Aeneas who has his own interesting story who we saw earlier on was saved by Apollo the other one is Odysseus from Ithaca wily Odysseus and out of all these people who did or didn't go back home what happened to him well I am pleased to tell you that I spoke to Stanley Lombardo who created this most excellent translation on the phone the other day about the possibility of continuing this series and he said go for it so we will be continuing season two of Peter Presents with Homer's Odyssey as translated by Stanley Lombardo now uh, I'm very excited about this, but I want to let you know something about how this series might be a little different. Number one, if you look at this book, okay, and how messed up and well read it is versus this thing, which looks practically brand new, I will be honest that I am not nearly as familiar with this as I am with Iliad. <laughs> so, but it's quite fitting, I think, because Odyssey is a journey about a warrior and the difficulties of returning home 
And uh, so I think we'll be going on that journey together, if you will join me for it. So we'll be doing that. We will be taking a short break from Peter Presents, um, probably uh, a week or two. I want to study up more so that I can get more into the analysis and continue to bring similar content to what you're used to and rebrand the show a little bit. So we're going to be taking a short break, and then we'll have a season two. And we'll find out exactly what happened with Odysseus after the Trojan War. So, before I give my final remarks, um, I will say this is the mug I was using. <laughs> A nice big Texas mug. And I shall also be going into the chat. So, here we go. We are beginning the chat now. People came in saying, uh, Bubba the Musician saying, he, I'm here early. Benji the Koi Boy joined us. Excellent. He says, let's go. Mariah Whitaker. It's the first time I've been able to be here for the live show. I'm ready for the finale. Well, Mariah Whitaker, I'm very happy that you've enjoyed the show. Um, Mariah, from what I understand, uh, works during when we normally would do this show, but she would watch the episodes the following day, and I was very pleased that... Um, you, you enjoyed the show that, <laughs> like that, so thank you. Um, Joe says, yeah, Benji's here. Uh, Stacy says, as ready as I'll ever be. Man, we have like the whole crowd here. We got Gorham Darth Cal singing, bring it on. Joe says, our last episode. I'm getting misty already. Gorham Darth Cal says, I'm gonna miss this song. Yeah. Um, Benji <laughs> says, it's a classic. Bubba says, huzzah! Stacy says, and it all circles back to an apple. Yep. Benji the Koi Boy, Paris cries in Faramir. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, there's an interesting parallel, I guess, between Paris and Hector for the Lord of the Rings characters Boromir and Faramir in an interesting way. Although I like Faramir a lot more than Paris, I will say that. Um, let's see. Stacy says, ouch, pretty hostile words from father to sons. Yeah, grief. Grief makes all kinds of horrible things come out. Um, back when, when Priam is saying, like, I wish Hector had lived and the rest of you had died. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Joe says, I wouldn't want to fill the cart after that rant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stacy says, interesting that we have Achilles telling Priam to remember to eat, becoming human again. Yes, he is. Yeah, Achilles has changed. Um, let's see. Uh, so Bubba says, so it was the story of Hector. I disagree. I think this was the story of Achilles. I think that um, Hector is the hero but that this is about Achilles. And because um, everything that happens is really because of him or how it affects him later, or, in, or specifically how it doesn't affect him, uh, like when he isn't sad when certain people are dying and so on. Um, let's see, Stacy says, nothing like a grief shared. Forgiveness is only warranted when a wrong has been perpetrated. That's right. Isn't that interesting how Forgiveness is only justified when a wrong has been perpetrated, but in a weird way, forgiveness is like giving up justice sometimes. I think that's very interesting. It's, I think forgiveness is unfair and pretty irrational and the only chance we have. Um, <laughs> so... Let's see. Uh, Mariah says, thank you for 25 great episodes, the Peter. Well, thank you very much for watching all of the episodes, Mariah. I'm really impressed that anybody got through all of this. And uh, the fact that it's been a pretty regular group of people who've gone through is really awesome. So thank you all for doing that. Um, let's see. Uh, Joe says, I was waiting for the Trojan horse. And uh, <laughs> Goram says, I was waiting for Trojan Man to swoop in. And uh, they never released the Kraken. I know, different story. Uh, not cool, Neptolemus. Yeah, isn't it interesting that Neptolemus went on to 
do what his father did in public probably because he didn't hear about what happened between Achilles and Priam in private. Let's see. Poor Andromache, to live through all that and live to old age. Yes, but at the end of it, she did get to be cared for by her youngest son, which is kind of nice. Um, so Ben says, ooh, we get in season two. Gorham says, yay, yay, season two. Oh, I'm glad you guys are happy about the Odyssey. <laughs> Good. Um, yes, Stacy Regan says, Odyssey, PTSD Greek style? Yep. Benji says, except unlike Paris, Faramir isn't a wimpy little bitch boy. <laughs> That's true. Faramir was awesome. Faramir was so much better. I still have a hard time forgiving people who aren't sorry. This is a topic I have a lot of interest in. Yeah, well, oh, I'm being silly. There's one other group of people that I forgot to mention what happens to them. How obvious. Menelaus and Helen. Can you guess what happened to both of them? Well, Menelaus and Helen, of course, were reunited. And Helen came back to Menelaus. And the two of them made up and forgave each other, remarried, and lived together, ruling Sparta. Interesting, isn't it? After all that, they still got back together. Huh. Wow. Those two are probably meant to be together. Yeah, I think... Um, now, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea that I have about forgiveness, um, <laughs> which when Joe says about I have a hard time forgiving people who aren't sorry. Um, but the idea, um, forgiveness doesn't always mean that you don't still serve justice, for instance. I think, though, maybe the most... I, forgiveness is such an interesting thing because it's not in a lot of stories uh, because we don't like having forgiveness at the end of a story we want to see the bad guy get killed by the good guy we want to see justice served we want the satisfying lopping off of the head you know all that we like how awful would so many stories be if like at the end, you know, the bad guys was like, sorry, and then the good guys like, I forgive you and went away. You know, like, that's a terrible story, right? Well, that's not exactly totally how forgiveness works uh, necessarily, but yeah, it's um, my, th that being the theme and how I feel about forgiveness as a topic, which is something that I struggle with. I personally... Um, hold on to anger a lot. I've gotten a lot better about letting things go, and I think Iliad has a lot to do with that, actually, um, which is one reason why it's my favorite book. But, um, you know, it's... Uh, some people I, I know think that forgiveness is bad or, like, doesn't work for some people because... Like if you if you forgive someone who wrongs you and then you keep letting them do something to you or like you accept that you did something wrong to the, make them do that or whatever. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. Forgiveness isn't, especially in this book, isn't acting like the other person isn't ever going to hurt you someday. Um, in all actuality, the you don't ever have to meet the person who wronged you in order to forgive them. So um, I would encourage anybody who speaks against forgiveness that to consider that you don't know what the heck you're talking about. And um, so there we go. Uh, let's see. Um, yes. Uh, uh, so Joe says, wow, I'm guessing about Menelaus and Helen getting back together. Goram says, that's pretty frustrating. <laughs> 
Bubba says, then that story about them immigrating to Colorado and starting a weed farm wasn't true? No, it wasn't. Thank you for asking. Um, Benji the Koi Boy says, Spy Kids 3 has entered the chat. There is one scene in Spy Kids 3D which I would encourage you to watch the entire movie for. Uh, the rest of it is, I don't, whatever, but there's one scene in that movie that is amazing to me. Uh, let's see. Stacy says, Les Mis forgiveness drove Javert to, uh, spoiler alert. Um, so anyway, with that, hmm. Yeah. A lot to unpack. And, uh, but I want, I think we're winding down now. Um, I'll say this. Uh, we will be having a bonus pre-recorded episode of The Ships. It's happening, which uh, will be shown sometime between now and season two's beginning. So that'll be a nice little Christmas special in July to tide you over. And then we have, uh, and then of course we'll continue with Odyssey. Um, I've had a fantastic time reading this book. Thank you very much for listening to this reading. Thank you for listening to my analysis and analysis and commentary. Thank you for joining the chat. Thank you for giving me uh, something to look forward to every three days or so during this crazy quarantine. I think it's funny how this show started because of the pandemic and this book starts with a plague. And then the more I've, with my analysis and commentary, I really try to avoid talking about current events too much especially polarizing ones i think that part of although i have my opinions about things that are going on i think that uh part of the value of these types of things is that they give us a break which i think are important just like i think it's important to eat and alleviate your anger from every once in a while um and uh, are the parallels obvious enough yet <laughs> but uh I the more that I've read this book obviously this time it's been the most intense because I'm reading it aloud I feel like there's people listening to me when I read it um, and I've just had a blast with it and it's really helped me to process a lot of what's going on in the world now even uh, even though this is basically the Avengers Infinity War which is why <laughs> of the um, Greek mythology. And I say Infinity War because this isn't the Avengers Endgame because <laughs> it's we didn't get the Trojan horse or anything. The Trojan horse and all those other things that we learned about actually continued in the epic cycle. We don't have those poems anymore. Otherwise, I would read them. There are two other poems that are part of the epic cycle that we have. Odyssey and Aeneid, which is... Um, about Aeneas. So Iliad, you've been a, a fantastic read. Um, I will treasure you always. And this book is full of notes, by the way. I was penning down like everything when I was reading it again. So have a, um, yeah, thanks. Uh, just thanks a lot, guys. And I hope that, um, I, I don't, you know, I hope this book will be something that You'll look back on fondly when the world is less crazy or when it gets worse. And uh, I hope that uh, you will, you know, I encourage you to get your own copy of this. There's a link in the description. It really reads well, as you know. And I am determined to do this whole series again someday. Uh, just, I mean, like, I, I just, I'm going to keep really reading Iliad forever. And I thank you for being there with me. So, um, let's see. Da -da -da. Benji says we kind of uh, Benji says we kind of get in the Aeneid don't we uh, the horse that is yeah there's a lot of stuff in the epic cycle that is um, uh, referenced throughout the Aeneid the interesting thing about the Aeneid is that it's not written by Homer it was written much later by someone else um, so but it's it's an interesting like I guess you could say they've been you know going back and making sequels years after the fact for a long time uh, but yeah oh and i'll just show you a better close-up of this let me go back here 
Once again, Stanley Lombardo and Hackett Publishing picking the best covers for a book possible, Odyssey, Homer, a picture of Earth from the moon. Trying to get home. You shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but if you did, these would be the best ones. So, anyhow. Alright, guys. I don't... I don't want to go. I don't want to stop this chat. Uh, but, I guess with that, I'll, I'll get the ships to you. Thanks again for being a part of this. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, and that if there's anything profound that has come across to you, um, I hope I didn't over explain that because I think one of the values I've gotten out of this book is the things that I've thought of as a result of reading it. And in fact, I put more than 24 hours worth of content all about that on this channel. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Until we meet again, this is Peter Presents Iliad for the last time. Soon to be Peter Presents Odyssey by Homer. And yes, I will be doing a Texas accent for our hero through the whole thing. Have a wonderful night. I hope you had a wonderful drink. And um, thanks again. Cheers. <laughs>